Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jane Sutton, Executive Director of the Flexible Space Association, and welcome to the latest in our series of Workspace Wisdom webinars. Um, a topic that comes up a lot when we talk to our members is what more they can be doing on environmental sustainability matters and, and getting a better understanding of that because it's something that um, I know that your clients are also keen, keen to see. Um, so I'm really pleased that today we're joined by two experts in, in this area, um, Laura McCullough and Sophie Med of Heart of the City. And they will talk a little bit more about what, what that organisation does um, as they take you through the presentation. Um, so we've got qu any questions that you've got, please put them into the chat box. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, I shall come back on and field those questions and, and any others that, that come in. Um, so I'm going to hand over now, get their presentation on screen and hand over to Sophie and Laura and see you in a bit. Thanks, Jane. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today at this Wisdom webinar. Um, I'm Sophie. I work for Heart of the City. Um, just to give you a tiny bit of background about Heart of the City, we are an independent charity and we are housed by the City of London Corporation. And we have formed to support small to medium sized enterprises, kickstart their sustainable uh, sustainability journey. We have a number of courses built for small businesses uh, around taking climate action and also about bedding in your responsible business strategy. Um, so today we're going to be talking to you about making your flexible workspace um, businesses a force for good. Um, and so without further ado, this is me, Sophie. Um, I'm head of business development and external engagement. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit before I hand over to my colleague, Laura, um, just to do a bit of scene setting. And Laura will take you through some of the more practical steps and insights around the sustainability journey many of your clients and customers will be on. So. I'm just going to set the scene and predominantly talk about the rising prioritization of sustainability. Um, sustainability is, of course, when businesses consider the social envir and environmental factors in addition to profit when looking at their business. So that businesses will prioritize sustainability, and I'm sure many of you yourselves do, for a variety of reasons, all of which help contribute to a healthy bottom line. So some of these key drivers um, in the prioritization of sustainability include the ability to attract and engage top talent, operational efficiency. So if you're driving down the cost relating to items such as waste disposal, this is, this is uh, improving the efficiency of your organization. Improved reputation and ability to mitigate potential PR disasters that can cost quite a lot of money. Um, increased innovation and ability to leverage new opportunities. So when you sit and rethink about your operations to support social and environmental needs, um, this also helps businesses to adapt and evolve and build new products and services and partnerships. And also investors are, are very much prioritizing and assessing what they call ESG credentials. So the environmental, social and governance factors when considering um, investing in businesses. Um, and when we think about sustainability, net zero um, is really, really key to this journey. Um, net zero really refer refers to achieving a balance between the amount of greenhouse gas emissions produced and the amount re removed from the atmosphere. And in 2019, the UK passed legislation requiring the government to reduce the UK's net emissions of greenhouse gases by 100 percent relative to 1990 levels. And their their aim is to do this by 2050. So this really is an imperative for us all to work together, government, business and civil society in order to to reach net zero. And net zero is a global imperative as well, because it doesn't just protect the environment and biodiversity, but it also fosters economic resilience and innovation and reduces systemic risks such as extreme weather events, which we've seen happening across Europe this year. Um, 
Furthermore, this global commitment to net zero helps us to build international cooperation and a unified uh, approach to tackling the climate, climate crisis. And this means that the business community is able to align and work together globally to find shared value um, through the prioritization of implementing sustainable policies. So really, businesses, governments and citizens all are going to have to work together to achieve this transition. Um, and with this comes a changing legislative and regulatory landscape. So um, businesses can either be directly impacted by this regulation and legislation. They can be looking to future proof and get ahead of the game. So preempting legislation that may be coming into fruition soon or they may be impacted indirectly. And we find this very much with small businesses. So the net zero legislation is fairly similar to the modern slavery act that happened in that it, it assesses the whole supply chain. So considering net zero specifically, businesses over a certain size and public institutions are required to report on their emissions. And these tend to be, these are split into what they call scope one, two, and three. And for today, it's really important to think about scope three, because these are the emissions which are in, which are uh, out of your control as an organization because they are created predominantly by your suppliers. And so what we're finding at Heart of the City is more and more that businesses are looking to access emissions information from their suppliers. Now, just like the Modern Slavery Act, you may not actually be in that supply chain, but you may be the supplier of a supplier who is in that supply chain. So no matter how far down the line you are, you will actually start to be asked for this information and this data. Um, so it's really quite critical that we support small businesses. And I would presume um, a lot of these will include your clients and customers to actually get on the net zero, um, get on their net zero journey so that they have this information ready and available because it is becoming more and more critical to accessing contracts and accessing business. And so what are the benefits for, for you? Well, of course, um, attraction and retention. So if you're able to make data, emissions data, easily accessible and available to your customers and clients, um, this really helps them with their own reporting and it saves them so much time. So if you ensure that you have your own emissions plans in place, your own strategy in place, this can actually be utilized by those who are actually renting space within your, within your work flexible workspace. Um, so this will really help you stand out from the crowd, but also it will save your clients and customers so much time. Um, a good and robust sustainability plan that is well communicated um, can really differentiate you in, a, in the marketplace. But really importantly, I think in terms of setting the scene, a clear and well communicated sustainability plan really opens up collaboration opportunities. And I know that we'll touch on some of what those collaboration opportunities with your clients and customers can be. But also it's important to think about the wider ecosystem in your area. So, for example, um, if you look at, say, Manchester City Council, their vision as a city is to be healthy, green and socially just city. And they have a net zero target, which is 12 years ahead of the UK government's target. So what this means is there's plenty of activity and networks happening in, in the Manchester area, not just Manchester. I'm using Manchester as an example of where you can actually get involved, access grants, access new networks, build new partnerships and really take a leadership role in terms of shaping the agenda. Um, and also cost savings, working with your customers and clients to towards sustainability goals will res result in cost savings for you, which is obviously great and drives benefit back into your business. So that's just a little bit of an overview of kind of setting the scene around sustainability, why it's increasingly important, and some of the sort of areas that it can benefit your business. And now I want to hand over to Laura, who will be able to take us through some more practical steps and insights around uh, our work with small businesses. Thanks, Sophie. That's really great to start with that the benefits that, that people can see. So 
I will give a really brief introduction to myself. So yeah, I'm, I'm Laura, the Net Zero Programme Manager at Heart of the City, and I've been building our small business Net Zero Guidance for, for a few years now. And I've worked for, for a number of years helping small businesses. It's, it's about over 150 small businesses now working towards net zero. So in this section, I'm going to be focused starting with a little bit of small business insight from those businesses that I've that I've been working with at, at Heart of the City and then go into some of those ideas which you could take away as flexible workspace and um, providers some new practical ideas and suggestions um, so that'll be the second second part Great. So I mentioned I've been working with a number of, of SMEs, so small and medium sized businesses, up to 250 employees on their journey to net zero. They do cover a, a wide range of industries from construction to hospitality to professional services and, and many more. So we've kind of had that breadth of, of small businesses. And from that, we have actually seen some, some trends across the vast majority of those organisations in terms of both them getting started with net zero but also how they're getting on and implementing the work required once they're once they're on their journey so in terms of why they're getting started and, and Sophie touched a bit on this at, at the beginning the vast majority are getting started um, due to their customers um, asking for this information or asking them to, to work towards net zero and for the businesses we work with it is those large businesses in their in their customer base and that all stems from those large businesses really looking at their scope three emissions and looking at how they can reduce their own operational emissions on their own trajectory to net zero and starting to have a real laser focus and lens on their supply chain, which is made up of small businesses, either in their tier one or as Sophie's mentioned, tier two, tier three um, suppliers as well which is essentially either kickstarting those small businesses to, to start looking at net zero or really rapidly accelerating what they're already doing. Um, so that is a real, real push from, from large businesses. Small businesses are seeing a huge increase in, in data requests because of this, um, and that in the variety, the nature, the type of data they're being asked for as well. So it can be tricky for, for small businesses, actually, as well as all organisations. But what we're seeing from the more advanced end where customers are either kind of mandating that small businesses are, are working towards net zero or really specifying certain accreditations they need to work towards in order to secure work from them um we're seeing a lot more granular data being asked for in terms of in terms of footprint measurements of those smaller businesses and what that has led to is a real chain reaction of data requests so it's starting with those large businesses coming to the small business and then what we're seeing is that's being passed on to in a lot of cases flexible workspace providers so small businesses are asking for their utility emissions whether that be their electricity any gas within the building um, any water for example so we're seeing that those data requests being pushed down that supply chain and encompassing a really, really large amount of, of businesses and, and including a real broad range of requirements as well. So um, that's kind of in terms of data requests, but other things we're seeing are small businesses are super motivated to be working towards net zero. Um, for that reason but also actually a lot of them a lot of people know it's the right thing to do and do want to work towards net zero but what we are seeing with small businesses they just don't have the same resource or capacity as large organizations who have you know whole teams of people working on this it's normally just an individual within the organization who is doing this on top of their whole full-time day job as well so it's really hard for them to be able to push this forward within an organisation on top of everything else that, that, that they have going on. So what we found is that they really need support and guidance to be able to succeed in this net zero space um, and, and really they need the hard work taken out of it for them. So the hard work of just understanding the net zero space as a whole um, so that they can really focus on the unique elements for their business in terms of data collection um, and making those sustainable changes as well so they really want to be motivated and do this work but it is difficult um, as well 
So yeah, in summary, we are seeing the number of small businesses working on net zero just rapidly increase by the day. And over the years, it has really rapidly increased. But there does need to be that support and guidance to assist them to drive this work forward. So I'm going to now move on to some of the more practical ideas about um, what you can be doing as, as flexible workspaces. So right, I'm going to focus on really kind of operational ideas. So some of you may be aware that um, about 80% of buildings that will exist in 2050 which is that UK net zero target goal already exists today so huge amount of building stock that's already been built there needs to be a real focus on operational efficiency and how buildings are used by occupiers um, there is another way which is to look at retrofitting and that's how you improve building stock kind of from a from a construction point of view but I'm going to focus on that operational um, level and I've broken it down into kind of strategic ideas, operational ideas and engagement ideas um, So I get started. And I do know that there is a real mix of starting points here um, with as the providers yourself. Some of you are, are advanced and some are also just getting on your journey now. So hopefully throughout there is something you can pick up. Um, and if you are doing all of it, hopefully it really solidifies that you are in a really great position to see those benefits that Sophie mentioned at the beginning to your to your workspace. So really the first thing any organisation should be doing is really looking at mapping out your ownership and responsibility as an organisation. So in terms of flexible workspaces, each provider will, will likely have a different makeup and responsibility over a certain building or groups of buildings or space. So it's a really good idea to start off by understanding what you control and what you need to be looking at, whether that be the utilities and the subcontractors for the buildings, whether that be maintenance, cleaning, um, subcontractors, for example, all the way down to the refreshments provided within the space or the furniture that's that's purchased on behalf of clients um, as well, so that you really get, get a list that over time you can look at and start targeting and improving those, those areas. So essentially it's your starting point in the plan um, so that it's most daunting of where to, like not knowing where to start you'll have a list in front of you um, and then you can start picking out some elements that you can get going with second suggestion is to create a green group so we've seen green groups be a hugely powerful tool within organizations um, and actually yeah within and also between organizations as well so for flexible workspace providers um kind of having a building green group made up of potential representatives from the different client clients that you have can be a really great way to pr promote the environmental sustainability work that you're doing within your organization and workspace um, to reach net zero but also to for net zero on the whole there really needs to be a huge amount of knowledge sharing and collaboration between between everybody so it provides that space to um, do that collaboration and, and knowledge sharing it's also a way to create less resistance between clients and yourself so that they really understand the journey you're going on as an organization that they feel part of that so instead of potentially things being imposed on them whether that be building work or whether that be a change in providers or anything like that they really feel part of the journey and really feel part of that change and can really spur on um, that engagement piece rather than creating any resistance from that and they'll feel brought in but it is also a great way to you, for you to hear from those organisations and, and clients about what they'd like to see as, as part of the building um, and as part of the flexible workspace and um, be part of that community that small businesses can really actually appreciate when they work towards net zero as it can often be quite a lonely and isolating space when you are a singular person working on it so to have that space where you can knowledge share and feel part of a community can be really invaluable to to organizations as well so we'd really recommend creating a green group for a, for a multiple um a multitude of reasons and lastly, on the strategic ideas is to look at certifications and accreditations. Um, I've just put two examples on screen of the B Corp and the Well Building Standard. Um, they're great, really one, to be able to show what you're doing and, and how good you are as an organisation. But also they are really great opportunities for you to learn from them and look at what they're asking organisations to do in their scoring criteria 
and again really use that as a matrix or a guide or a plan to move forward your environmental sustainability initiatives as well so that you're not kind of googling lots of different areas of how do I improve efficiency or or electricity efficiency whatever it may be you can just use these as tick boxes and kind of a guide of best practice of what you need to do so um, I really recommend looking at those so these strategic ideas are more ideas to help you get set up um, and help you make a plan of what you need to do and be able to check in um, over time but I'm going to move on to operational ideas and these are some ideas about what you can do to improve a workspace and how it's used um, and some are quick wins and some are longer term actions which I'll touch on. So the top one is a really quick win. It's changing your energy supply to a renewable energy supply if you haven't already. Um, um, which, yeah, is quite a simple, relatively simple thing to do. But although that is a quick win, you really need to be looking at your absolute carbon reduction. So it's really positive to change to a green energy supplier, but that doesn't mean you can still just use um, an extortionate amount of energy throughout the day and, and well, throughout all days, you still need to look at that reduction over time. So um, some things you can look at are LED lightings, they're less energy intensive, um, which is a really good quick win. And also things you can look at are motion sensitive lighting. So you don't have to rely on individuals turning on and off lights or equipment because um, human error comes into that a lot and people and it just doesn't happen. So motion sensitive lights are a great one to make sure that buildings and spaces are optimised. But also with motion sensor lights is to really look at optimizing them themselves. So I know a lot of organizations fall kind of short of optimizing these services. So it's great that when someone walks on a floor, the lights turn on and the sensors are working. But actually, there is so much natural light coming in from all the windows that are in the office space that those lights don't need to be on. So there's still kind of a second layer of that work of um, motion sensor lights to be able to really optimize them and make sure that they're working with the building and the time of day and the seasons that we're in. Um, and you can also look at kind of optimizing the operational efficiency of the building as well. So I would say this is a bit more of a longer term piece of work and looking a bit more holistically and radically at the space, um, but really looking at how it's used and the um, the occupancy rate of a floor. So um, I've, we've spoken to a few different providers before and they, they've said, you know, we have four floor spaces and there's one person in from each organisation on a Friday. So the building's running at 100% occupancy rate, but actually there's only four people in. So it's really looking at how can you maximise and really improve those operational levels? Can you get them all into one area so that only one floor is on instead of four and looking at how to really change the use of the space? Um, and then lastly on that is really looking at smart buildings. So there are a lot of organisations out there looking at how you can use real time data to track and monitor building usage to help those improvements. Um, and um, we, we know an organisation called Unified. Paul Sheedy is the founder and CEO of that organisation who is really passionate about this work. Um, and we can share details in, with you after if you're interested in that. But really looking at that, it's exactly at that occupancy level and seeing how you can improve efficiency. Um, Next, just to touch on waste, if you have control over that as, as a provider, so looking at appropriate bin allocation and um, making sure that um, hopefully no one does, but there's no bins under individual desks because that really is no one recycles when that happens. Everything goes into one bin and it all goes to landfill. So making sure that you're kind of have appropriate bin allocation and looking that it's really well signposted and clear what can be thrown in what, what bin. Um, and making sure they're all really obvious so that people know that they can use them and hopefully to prevent wish cycling as well, which is when people hope that something can be recycled and recycle it with the best intentions, but actually it can't be recycled. It's also worth talking to your waste provider around things like their waste streams. Um, can they provide extra waste bins for things like hard to recycle items? So soft plastics, for example, is really common ones that, that can't be recycled, like crisp packets um, and things like that, to see if they can recycle those hard to recycle items. Um, and 
to see if they can have zero waste go to landfill as well. So whether that's increasing recycling rates or if they can send it to kind of sites where it gets burned and then put back into the grid as energy. So they're the types of questions you can be asking your provider um, to see what they're doing and potentially looking to using other providers that can give you those kind of environmental um, assurances. So moving on to water. So the vast majority of water used within a kind of commercial building space is within the restroom area. Um, so there's just a few examples there that you can look at, like low flow toilets or taps with aerators on to really slow down the flow of water and reduce that wastage. Um, some water providers do offer free um, water audits. So they'll come in, check over your space and, and give you kind of an action plan of things that they'd recommend that you implement. So have a look at your water provider if they offer anything like that. That can be a really great way to, to find out what you need to be doing. I've also have become familiar and I really, really love what an organisation called Propel Air um, are doing. So they are really reducing the amount of water waste within toilets themselves. So they reduce a, a carbon footprint of a toilet by up to 80% um, and their toilets use 15% less, uh, only use 15% of water compared to normal toilets. So they kind of use air and suction. You can Google that. I'm, I'm not the toilet. I don't make the toilets. I'm not sure on that, but and they're much more sustainable and can create those cost savings and um, carbon savings for you as well. So I'd look into Propel Air. Chemicals is often one organisations forget about. Um, so making sure that any cleaning um, any clean cleaning products you use don't have really harmful toxic chemicals in that because um, they can obviously be really harmful to the environment. Looking at solar glazing on, on windows, for example, is another um, thing that you can look at. So a lot of commercial buildings can have lots of windows that look really great, but they can really heat up internal spaces. And what that means is you're in, um, kind of enforcing that the air conditioning units need to be on to cool down those spaces. So really have a look at any solar glazing shades or you can kind of get kind of sticky things that you can put on windows as well to reduce that glare and really cool down the internal space and um, minimise the, the amount of time the air conditioning units need to be on for as well. So that's a quick win that, that can be implemented as well. Um, green spaces, they look great and they have a real range of environmental benefits from um, kind of biodiversity to carbon sequestering um, and they also have a range of well-being benefits as well so I really look if it's possible to you to have to have green spaces on your roofs or your walls and also there's always indoor plants that you can have as well which um, look great as I say they have those well-being benefits um, and can provide those environmental benefits as well um, and, and probably one that you're all familiar with lastly is to remove all single use plastics from from your office space but also single use items so things like um, any single use cutlery straws plates things like that and just replacing them with the alternatives making sure you have cutlery that people within your workspace can use so that they don't if they go out for lunch they don't need to pick up plastic cutlery from there um, looking at that you have enough mugs and cups for people to use but again looking at everything you provide so making sure um, for example, if you provide tea and coffee that you don't have tea bags that come in, there's kind of paper, paper sachets that you rip open once that goes in the bin and then you have a tea bag you can use. Can you stop all of that additional waste that, does, that isn't really necessary to have? Um, again, looking at your kind of the food that you provide in the office as well. So use that holistic lens of everything that you provide. Um, and then moving on to my next slide, which is about engagement ideas. So as actually a flexible workspace, you're probably aware that you're in a really unique position to really help galvanise collective action between all the different clients within your, within your workspace and to work to advocate and influence environmental sustainability and to encourage behaviour change as well. So there's lots of things you can do that can do all of that but also act as kind of a unique selling point for your, your organization as well 
So I've just jotted down some ideas. I'll briefly talk through them, but there's things like consolidating delivery. So can you look at if you can act as a facilitator to help arrange this between your different clients? Um, I'd say the only issue with this is that it requires a lot of forward planning from those organizations to know what they need to buy and, and where they would like to buy it from. So it doesn't always happen, but yeah, seeing if you can really influence that is, is positive. There's also um, some trials going on around the UK in different areas with um, delivery hubs. So that's where you can promote as, as a flexible workspace for these organisations to get their items delivered to this delivery hub. Um, and then kind of once a week or once a day, whatever the setup may be, um, one truck will bring all the deliveries to your office rather than having all the different trucks coming. So look at if that's something you can promote within your organisation as well. Um, look at encouraging stairs over lifts um, so that people, there's wellbeing benefits around that, but also obviously that saves electricity and energy of running the lifts. It's about 130 kilograms of carbon dioxide per person a year. So there's huge potential savings there. I think something just that I've noticed from a few different um, flexible workspaces I've been in is personally I, I find it really hard to even locate the lifts so even simple things like that of sign uh, sorry locate the stairs so even simple things like that of just signposting to where the stairs are um, and listing those carbon and also well-being benefits are really useful to encourage people to to make that behavior change other things depending on what you provide within your workspace is looking at things if you provide food looking at meat free days whether you can provide vegetarian meals vegan meals but also look at your snacks and things like that look at what ingredients they use and if you can use ones without palm oil for example as well so again that holistic lens around the whole environmental piece and everything you're providing um, you can do other things as well to provide um, sustainable kind of commutes into work. So look at providing bike racks so that people can safely store their bikes if they cycle into work and shower facilities as well. It's always really useful to encourage people to cycle as um, people can get quite sweaty on their commute in and don't want to sit all day um, in that. They like to have a shower. Um, potentially if you're in an area that doesn't have as good um, public transport routes, you could look at providing electric vehicle charging points as well. And there's lots of different setups you can have around that. So really think about that piece as well, about how your clients can commute into work. And I think lastly, because I've thrown loads and loads of tips at you, is around that engagement piece you can have and the extra bits that you provide. So I know a lot of workspaces provide kind of lunch and learns or activities for their clients. And I think really look at how you can spin and weave environmental um, kind of areas and education into that. So from the obvious, it's like having an environmental lunch and learn, um, but also things like having activities such as, I don't know, how to mend your clothes. So a sewing, um, a sewing activity, for example. So that links into kind of reducing waste and reusing clothing, for example, um, or kind of client volunteering days around kind of either beach cleanups or river cleanups. So you can make it really fun and engaging, but always have the environmental spin on it um, as well. So they're all things that you can think about within those activities, as well as aligning them to awareness days to really get that push across that the other organisations within the UK are aligning to as well, whether that be Earth Hour, um, but yeah, there's awareness days for everything that we we share or you can find online. Um, so yeah, to get that really cohesive push um, across. So that's a few engagement ideas that we have. I know that the slides are being shared with you after the recordings that you can see them written down as, as that's a lot to throw at you at once. But I'm now going to pass over to Sophie again, who's going to kind of share some more resources to support you where a lot of these ideas are included. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Loads of, loads of um, excellent hints and tips to take away there. And uh, if you do implement any of those, please remember, record them and uh, make sure you tell everyone, because um, that is obviously part of your uh, sustainability strategy. Um, and it's really great for others to hear what everyone else is, is up to. In terms of resources for action, um, we do, we will be sharing these links. Um, we do have a free climate action toolkit. 
And just going back to Laura's um, points around engagement, you could actually use this toolkit. It's free to download. You could maybe use it to um, deliver some collaborative sessions with your clients and customers around how to uh, support each other in taking climate action. So you could use that toolkit as a framework. And we also offer um, sort of facilitated sessions as well. So if that's something of interest to you, please do uh, get in touch with us. We also have a course called uh, Climate for SMEs, Four Steps to Action. This is a course that um, is headed up and run by Laura, uh, where it's really focusing on taking those um, essential green skills and, and, and delivering them back into, into uh, small to medium sized enterprises. And this course is actually funded by the City of London Corporation. So they are paying for all small businesses in the square mile to take part in that course. Reason being, they themselves as an area um, have net zero ambitions. So this is part of their sustainability strategy so that course is free for anyone who is um in the in the square mile if you're not in the square mile because i know it's not the center of the universe um we do actually offer paid for, a, a number of paid for places on that course but also we work with organizations to take that course and deliver a sort of bespoke program for um for for those who are looking to support people in their supply chain to actually get to uh, net zero so there's that option as well and i would really implore that you you know wherever in the uk that you're based that you check with your regional or local authority um, there's lots of activity going on across the country um, it varies from area to area uh, we mentioned manchester at the top of this program at the top of this presentation you know when we're looking at london um, there are other priorities but there are lots of grants there are lots of support networks um, these are really this this is really important because it allows you to plug into all the activity that's actually going on in the sustainability space in your local area and back to that kind of creating new innovative partnerships that can really really help your business so they're just some of the we'll send those links and also please do check with your regional and local authority um, for who else has activity that can support you guys in this space so um that's pretty much from Laura and myself uh, and we are here now to take any questions um, and field any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Sophie and Laura. An awful lot of information packed in um, to quite a short space of time. So thank you. We really love practical ideas on these webinars. So that's that was great. Um, just a reminder, we've still got a bit of time for questions if anybody wants to put anything into the, the chat box. But um, I have a, a couple to kick us off. Um, you covered quite quite a lot of ideas. And obviously, there's quite a lot for if you're starting, particularly if you're starting from scratch, it can be challenging of, of, of where to start. What would you suggest is a, a, a relatively quick win to engage clients in flexible workspaces in, in this kind of exercise? I guess, I guess, Laura, do you want to do that or take that question? Yeah, I can. Sorry, I was trying to come off mute. But I have no. now. <laughs> um, there's a variety of ways, but I would say things you've mentioned like creating that green group sharing a toolkit but just being really useful um to your clients and not just saying we want you to do this and not providing any resources to support them is really beneficial um but also um being really open and transparent with them so a lot of businesses we work with know that no one's you know, no one's got the answer yet, but everyone wants to know that people are on this journey, that they're personal, that they're human. So it's really useful to be open, transparent, and just really share the journey that you've been on with your clients to really open that dialogue up um, and to create a really um, great space for collaboration and sharing knowledge. But Sophie, do you have anything else you've learned from, from potentially larger organisations? Yeah, I think I think um, the key thing is to remember and just to reiterate what Laura said, actually, there a lot of people um, shy away from this space because they feel it's about getting a gold standard straight away. And this is really much more of a journey and a collaborative journey. So really kind of. Um, yeah, I would say working with your clients and customers together around, uh, you know, 
lunch and learns, engagement activity. And obviously, as Laura said, being really transparent through that activity around why you are doing what you're doing and how it can also benefit them as well. So understanding that, you know, this will be an area that will, if they're not already impacted, they will be soon. Um, and so really emphasizing that this is a value add um, that, that your workspace is providing. Okay, we'll assume everyone's got your details and bring us back onto this, all onto the screen now. Um, so if obviously in flexible workspaces, there's all manner of individuals and businesses based in them. And often with these things, you need that real collective to, to, to go forward with things. If there's a, um, a an organization or a company or even an individual in, in a workspace who just isn't interested in, in net zero and related matters, do you have any suggestions on how operators can engage with them? Yeah, I mean, sorry, yeah, uh, m mine would be to really nail the business case. So, you know, we can, taking climate action is a good thing to do for the planet, but it's really important to understand it's really good to do for business as well. Um, so I think that it's really about presenting that business case to, to people who perhaps need a bit more convincing to, to prioritise and, and take action. Another thing would be to bring in, other um, speakers or uh, businesses who've actually started their journey and actually um, talk about how it has actually benefited their business overall. That's a, that's another way of, to, of uh, I think, engaging people who maybe are slightly more reluctant. But Laura, have you, have you got any hints and tips for that? Um, yeah, I agree with what, with what you said, Sophie, around really around the business case of understanding their drivers. So many people have different drivers, whether that be it's a moral thing and they want to do it, they want to co they want cost savings or they want to be able to have a USP over their competitors. So really understanding what it is that, that drives them. But I'd also say consistency is key. So make sure that you're constantly sharing information. If you have a newsletter that goes out, is that something you can continually have something in there? Um, as I say, through any engagement activities you have or lunch and learns that you may do, always have the environmental spin on it. Whatever the topic is, there is a way to link environmental sustainability to it. So just, I think consistency is key. And also remembering that as a workspace, provider you are in a unique position then actually you can change a lot of things for them so you have control over their potentially their energy supplier as I say there's operational some operational efficiency so you can actually show them the benefits that you're having to them um, and really use that as a benefit um, as a USP of your organization to them so um, not everyone will be Will be able to be convinced about net zero and working towards it but i'd say understanding their drivers and showing what you can do for them is always positive great thank you so we've got a couple of um question, live questions that have just just come in so to pick those up um can you recommend suppliers that you know follow best practices how would you advise we source suppliers um so they particularly need a new waste removal company so perhaps without suggesting actual named companies what would you suggest as a, a process for that are, are there good places to look or, or similar is best to take that. I can Laura is best to take that one I'm a bit I don't know that the answer to that one I'm afraid yeah it's quite a tricky one to answer because it will really depend on in terms of waste removal company really depend on where you're based um as well so I'd recommend doing research but also just having a list of questions that you want to ask each each provider and removal company but I'd also recommend looking at RAP so WRAP, and they provide best practice around kind of waste and they have a waste calculator on there and um, they have kind of templates that you can use for waste provider um, tenders, etc. So they're a really useful company that I'd say go to them. They're kind of the experts in that space um, and they also cover UK wide as well. So you may be able to get a list of providers there. Great, thank you. So, and the next question I think emphasises the huge range of um, workspace operators out there. So we have the the very large commercial companies, the local authority run ones, and as, as this one is, it's from a from a charity that runs flexible workspace. So they're asking, what type of changes can we make with a smaller budget and limited staff and resources? 
can yes, happen. Uh, yeah, I think Laura, we, that's a common um, that's common that we have with our uh, small businesses, isn't it? Yes, it definitely is. So I'd recommend looking at our toolkit. So in there, we do have a list of changes that you can make. Some are quick wins with zero cost, and some are longer term, quite cost intensive. And um, so, yeah, have a look at that toolkit. But I'd recommend also we can share a link after but looking at what grants are available so um, again they vary between regions but for, for especially charities or organizations um, with, with lower funds there are lots of funds and grants um, and, and different pots of money out there to help you make sustainable changes so whether that be EV points I've mentioned electric vehicle points or whether that be improving insulation and um, there's lots of different pots of money that you can access from the government um, but also just planning for what even if you don't have the funds now at what you could do in the future just so that you have a plan ready so that if you do have a sudden pot of money that comes in to be able to do this work you can get started right away instead of then sitting and um, and taking a few months or potentially a few years to, to get started with the work so yeah it, it can be expensive, but there's lots of quick wins you can take, lots of grants available, and I'd say plan for, for if you did have the funds come in, what you would do with them. Okay, thank you. I think that was interesting. The, the electric vehicle um, portals, the, one of our, our members um, has installed a number of electric vehicle chargers um, working with a commercial company, which also for community use, which is a time when there isn't in, necessarily enough of those, is hopefully something that they as a business are adding to the, um, the local community more widely on this topic. So um, that's certainly, yeah, I think probably a, num a number of our member companies are in a position to, to be helping on that front as well as their own business. Now, a fi final question, um, which is potentially a bit dangerous, depending on what the answer is, but let's <laughs> let's go with it. Um, do you think flexible workspaces are inherently environmentally sustainable themselves? Laura, you're going <laughs> to... Yeah, I, yeah I, I would say, yeah, I would say 100%. I mean, it, it's not necessarily... I mean, and Laura, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's not necessarily more environmentally sustainable to work at home for example yeah that's completely correct it's actually over over the pandemic when people were working at home a lot of organizations saw their um or saw their carbon footprints increase just because a lot of businesses had been making efficiency changes for a number of years um and obviously in the home you don't have things like i don't know low flow flush toilets or zonal sensors you don't you don't live in an environment like that but i would answer yes and they have the potential to be but with with certain changes and i think with those operation efficiencies i mentioned with really looking at the space as a whole and encouraging you to look at how you run your flexible workspace to to make sure that they are efficient because yeah depending on the makeup and how organizations use them it can really cut down on an employee commuting time if there's a um, space near them. That real collective um, purchasing power can can lend to sustainable procurement. Um, having, yeah, more people as as I think the the shape and landscape of offices are changing. A lot of people are looking to downsize and potentially move to flexible workspaces um, as well. So I I do think that they are inherent or can be inherently environmental sustainable. Thank you. That's good news. <laughs> what we want to hear. Hopefully, also by by doing good things in in workspaces, it it, it makes people think about what they can be doing at home as as well. And um, it's, yeah, it's definitely a sort of. I think that's why business is very important in this piece, even around the sort of culture change. But also, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of people feel a bit at sea with this whole issue because it is such a gigantic issue and it can feel quite scary. So. Being able to provide an environment where the individual feels they can take some action is actually really good for, you know, first of all, the planet, but also the individual. So they feel a bit more in control and a bit more aware and a bit more uh, enabled to, to actually make change themselves. So I, I think that can often go underrated in terms of a, of a positive impact that we can have on our communities through workplaces and certainly um, flexible workspaces providing that 
just empowerment piece, I think is really, really important. And I, I did want to say, just going back to the charity as well, um, who's talking about working on a budget, there are lots of grants out there at the moment, green grants, but I really want to emphasize they're not going to be around forever. So I think this really is now the time to actually start planning the actions that you want to take um, and any investments that you may need to make, because it's actually cheaper to do that now, um, because I don't know, you know, that these grants will eventually when everything is compulsory and not and not optional which it is at the moment uh that's when the costs really going to kick in um so i think it's really important to start just start your journey and remember that it is a journey you don't have to get everything done tomorrow um but yeah really do reach out to your local authority and find out what grants are available and what investment is available for you to just get cracking and, and make some of those changes now that's a really good final um, bit of advice to end on, I think. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Sophie and Laura, for some really helpful um, ideas and suggestions and things to look up further and, and everything else. I think that's that we've, we've packed a lot in into the last 50 minutes. Um, just to look ahead. So we've got a couple more um, of our Workspace Wisdom webinars lined up. On the 11th of October, we're looking at capital allowances and tax incentives for investors in flexible workspace so something quite different and then on the 1st of November we're returning to a similar topic and something that was touched on in this presentation um, when we're looking at um, raising the standard for better businesses with B Corp which I, I know many of our um, member companies have are, have already got or they're on the journey to and others are interested so I think that's going to be a, a really useful one as well to provide a bit more guidance on that. And then finally, um, just a reminder to our members watching that our awards are currently open for entry with the deadline of the 26th of October. Um, and we've added for the first time a category on ESG. So that absolutely reflecting that we know that many um, of our member companies are looking at, at um, those areas at the moment. Um, and hopefully we're going to have some great examples of that through our award entries. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Sophie and Laura, and have a good rest of the day. Goodbye. Bye.